Malik, let me pull you in here because what what a lot of those examples, and I think Patrick, you even said it that, that sometimes the you cited a study where the person has been the recipient of an act of kindness feels like they're part of a community and part of the belonging. And what I was hearing was there were these warm and fuzzy feelings with the recipient, and there were the warm and fuzzy feelings with the people that were kind to somebody else. Um, again, I don't mean to be a wet blanket here. I have seen and I have extended kindness to people and I did not get back the warm and fuzzies from the person that was the recipient. The recipient of kindness doesn't always respond in a kind way. We could look to the historically to the, the civil rights movement in this country. Dr. King's nonviolent movement was all about nonviolence and, and kindness and often dogs were turned and, and hoses were turned against these people that were extending kindness. Malik, what can you say to, to those of us about the benefits to, to, to being kind when you don't you might not get back that immediate return that you might expect? Because the, the sad truth is in this world, we don't always get it back. Yeah, um, I guess the one thing would be is like being kind without those expectations of receiving anything back in general. So having that, that idea that if I do this, then I will receive something back kind of tarnishes the kind of the point um, of actually doing acts of kindness, right? Because of course you want people to get do, to reciprocate it, but it's not always the case. And I, for instance, I also work at a university and at that university, I work with students and there are several times to where I'm being, you know, I might go on my way to be like, you know, even I don't necessarily go over, I still make sure I follow within policy, but I might, you know, extend a rule or like allow people to do things and then the students might take advantage of that every time i when i do that it's a feeling of like it's a feeling of disappointment that's there whether i'm maybe i'm a little bit bothered by you know the acts of kind is not being recipro reciprocal um or not being respected in a sense however that doesn't stop me from um if I have another group of students that also need that same amount of grace, that doesn't stop me from giving those students that grace because just because one person doesn't, just because one person in particular does not have that, you know, doesn't show me that type of um, reciprocal respect for me, for the act of kindness that I'm doing from them, doesn't mean that other people won't and that other people don't deserve it. And also keeping it in mind that you know, when those other people do, like, you know, just when that one person does not reciprocal of it, there are so many people that will be in those so many people that will be may or may not have had someone show that act of kindness to them before. So even using it as a motivational factor, when you're the act of kindness that you are putting out there is not being reciprocated or respected. Yeah, I like that perspective. Really like the not tying it to expectation. When I was talking about the deli example for me earlier today, as I said, everybody else at the deli thought that I was committing an act of kindness. The one Karen, I'm sure she walked away and I'm sure when she told that story to family and friends, it was the jerk who was at the counter who snapped at her and she was just trying to get her roast beef or whatever. So we got to be you know, cognizant of the fact that people are going to perceive things differently and we don't have any control over how they perceive things. Patrick, you got something you want to add. And, and I never want to be accused of not giving you a platform. I know how hard it is for you to, to share your perspective. So why don't you tell us what you think? Thank you, Michael. That is You're a welcome. lot of for the day. <laughs> um, so I actually have an example today, and it's it's the first time that I encounter this kind of experience. Um, so as a clinician, I work with geriatric population. Most of my patients are in their 60, 70 and up. Um, and they love to chat. I don't know if you have noticed, but older folks just love to chat, especially those who don't have um, children of their own, offspring of their own. Um, and doesn't have a lot of that social interaction, especially during this pandemic. I love to chat. I have a problem of getting my patient to stop talking so I can do my job. Um, but today I had the opposite problem, which is chatting with this gal, gal about how her day was going and you know, asking her all the questions about her. I didn't say anything about myself. And she looked at me and said, you asked me too many questions. Can we just not talk? Wow. And I was taken aback, but then I put on my professional hat and like, oh, my apologies, we don't have to talk at all and continue the appointment doing what I do um, with her and then finish at the end. It was a very awkward situation. Um, in my institution, patient can review, uh, put a review on a provider, basically like a rating. And I have many, many good rating. I don't know if I'm gonna get a bad rating from this patient. Um, but what I want to mention is that, you know, like Malik was mentioning, 
there's many people who appreciate what you do when you commit act of kindness, and that's just one person who doesn't. Um, for me personally, that one person who take their time out to give a bad review usually sit with me a lot longer than those who just wrote glowing review of Butterfly and Patrick is the best PA ever. Um, I do want to bring up that you know you do not have the control of how people react or perceive your act of kindness or your intention when you interact with them. You do, however, have control over how you react to that um, interaction. And for me, if I get a bad review, oh well, you know, as long as I don't get fired, I'm good. Um, and I will not change how I interact with my patients because I know the majority of them love it and they crave it. They actually make appointments come in just to talk to me, even though that spot on their shoulder is nothing and they know it. I, I want to I want to joke now, Patrick, and I'm not going to. I'm resisting the joke. I I, I think I figured out how I'm, I'm going to do like your patient did. I'm going to say, Patrick, could you just stop talking and asking so many questions? You said you put on your clinical hat, your professional hat, and you just I was surprised you reacted that way. So now I know how to short circuit that when when you get kind of out of control. But all kidding aside, I want to say this to you, Patrick. You you being in the medical setting. Um, I have a lifetime starting from when I was probably eight or nine years old. I, I had a really rough spring and summer medically and in fact, almost died twice and, and, you know, got far closer to death than I want to even remember. Since then I have this, it used to be quite an extreme phobia about doctors and hospitals. So I always really, I'd be one of the ones that would give you a great rating. If someone comes in to greet me and they're warm and welcoming and conversational that helps alleviate my stress. And even now I've gotten a lot better at it. I wouldn't call it an extreme phobia anymore, but I get a little anxious when I have to trade doctors or go to someone new. So all kidding aside, keep doing what you're doing because you're making more of an impact. Forget that negative you know, rating or whatever that you may or may not get. Keep doing that because there are a lot of patients like me, you, you, clinicians like you kind of put me at ease instead of somebody coming with a clipboard and asking me a few questions and then roll up your sleeve and we're going to take some blood. It just drives me nuts. So keep doing what you do. Let's break. Let's, you know, we got just a few more minutes. Andre, I want to touch with you and Jonathan and you, Emilio, you guys are from the mentoring perspective, a lot of what we've talked about, what are your takeaways for the next time you're in front of some of those youth that you're going to be mentoring? What would you have to say? How, how are you going to kind of, um, carry this forward, so to speak, this conversation about acts of kindness, do you see yourself encouraging people to be maybe a little more kind, taking a second out? AJ touched on it. It doesn't cost a lot of money. and In a lot of cases, it doesn't cost any money at all to be nice to somebody. So Amelia, are you going to kind of pay that forward and kind of encourage your mentees to be a little more kind? Definitely will. Definitely uh, tell them to pay that forward, you know, because it could change the world. One man can and it's like a domino effect. One person's nice and they're like, all right, now I'm going to pay it forward. You know, um, a lot of time it's not what you say, but how you say it. Like if you bake a cake with love compared to baking a cake without love, that one with love is probably going to be better, you know, because they put more effort into it. So like if you're uh, doing the act of kindness with effort, they'll take that better. And, and do you think, I love that, I love that, Emilio. Do you think also, as you were talking, Emilio, this occurred to me and I'm looking at this, you know, little grid, we've got six, seven people. I don't think society promotes men of color who are kind. That's not a part of the trope that we hear about in the media, especially black men aren't kind, which is probably why people react a certain way when I'm extending kindness. They're leaning away going, what is this about? So I think there's a lot of power in a, in a group of men of color talking about acts of kindness. Let me just put that out there. Jonathan, what about you? How are you going to sort of, what's your takeaway for this conversation and how are you going to implement that in your mentoring work? Um, basically, let everybody know is, you know, acts of kindness also has, has to be what your in, intention is. If you're doing an act of kindness and you're more uh, looking for points, some people don't even want it. And what some people might think is you being kind, some people might, might be offended by it. You know, so it all depends on what that person's perception is of what your act of kindness is. Some people might, you know, what you do for some, I might not like what you did for for me, you know, what you did for her, you know, so it's, it's all based on what the individual is. So kindness could be something that's more of what an individual want and what they need at that time or what your act of kindness is. 
appreciate it. Really appreciate it. What about you, Andre? How are you going to sort of, you're the COO, you're running the place. So um, tell me how you're going to sort of take this conversation about acts of kindness and sort of pay it forward in your work. Two things I want to address. When you said that um, about how others accept your acts of kindness, you know, I, I was in a, a real busy hotel lobby. It's a huge hotel in Las Vegas. And I seen a lady struggling with her luggage and about five other bags. I mean, she was really struggling from the parking lot. And it's a long stretch into the check-in. And I, you know, I asked her kind of, I said, hey, ma'am, you know, are you okay? I said, do you need any help? I said, I'm going to the check-in the same way you're going. I can always help you. And she looked at me and she kind of like, thank you, but no thank you and kept moving. So sometimes, you know, I think it, it might have been perceived, number one, I think it might have been the opposite of, you know, our races or whatever, or maybe what she might have uh, maybe dealt with in her own personal life. But for me personally, I felt good just by offering the extending hand of helping. That's where I get the benefit from. You don't have to accept it, but the fact that I offered it. So what I would extend to the youth that I work with is, you know, the, the act of kindness you know, once you start experiencing an act of kindness, it makes you feel good. It's not necessarily for the other person. It makes you feel good. Um, and also explain to them that, you know, in doing so, you also might be making someone else feel good. And you also, I appreciate that, Andre. You also, I, I wonder about the impact that you even might have had to the other people in that parking lot. So the woman didn't respond in a way. Clearly, she needed some help. And for whatever reason, she didn't really respond in a, in a sort of welcoming way. But you may have set an example for other people. You said she was out there and you said for like five minutes. A lot of other people saw her in that five minutes and they didn't walk over and say, you need some help. So if I had been one of those people, you'd have done that in front of me. And I would have thought, wow, why didn't I think of that next time? I'm going to be that person. So sometimes you have an impact on people that aren't even a part of the direct interaction. Um, before we wrap us up, Malik, you were nodding just now. Is there anything you want to you want to say? And then I'm going to ask AJ, our, our, our youth guest, to kind of take us home and give us his overall perceptions of this conversation. But Malik, you nodded when Andre was talking about you feel good without getting anything back. Do you want to you touched on it before, but do you want to kind of reiterate that as we get ready to close? Yeah, I just um, just agree with Andre. And that goes back to like what we we're saying earlier, back to intent. Like if your intent is to be this kind person and do this thing without whether or not, regardless of the outcome, you know, in your mind, Andre knew in his mind that this woman seems like she's struggling. She looked like she could use some help. Her not accepting the help doesn't take away from him off, help, you know, by any means. So that's just kind of because that it just goes back to what we were saying earlier, that intent behind and just before we get to you, AJ, our, our friend and buddy, Patrick, what you got? Patrick, I know you got something you want to say. Well, Michael, I think the, the best way for us as a group of men of colors um, to do the act of kindness is to expose people to our act of kindness. Um, in the medical world and in the psychological world, and I think Malik, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a term called conditioning or reconditioning. Um, so there's this notion that not particularly in my race, because for whatever reason, Asian men are seem less um, threatening to many others compared to black men. Um, and I've had a conversation with my friends before. They just don't see black men as friendly or, or helpful or kind. And by continuing commit those act of kindness towards people, we exposure them to what kindness is among men of colors, and by exposing them, we reconditioning them over time to change that notion that black man is not kind or helpful. Um, that's what I have. I really appreciate that, Patrick. We may revisit this. We may have a part two because you just, you, you hit the nail on the head there. I have to say, and again, what we talk about in this forum is stays in the forum, right? When I watch, and Carter Todd is a great friend of mine. Uh, he's the guy that did the two minute video as we started us, us out. But when I listened to Carter and I looked at Carter, Carter is a very light skinned black man. And the thought occurred to me, Carter, you extending an act of kindness is going to be perceived a little differently than Andre Warren in the middle of a parking lot or me in a grocery store. And maybe we'll talk about colorism and kindness. I don't know. There's a seed there. I'm a, I'm a noodle on that one. 
Emilio, you, you're you're a, a, a Latino guy, and I'm sure your act of kindness extension might be perceived a little differently than than yours, AJ. It's just something I want to I want to think about. Um, but you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot more time to think about it now. This has been a really really incredible conversation. I think on acts of kindness, I want to thank everybody, Andre from the Hawk Institute, Jonathan, also Hawk Institute, Emilio Trejo Gallegos. Uh, he's a mentor. Always love having you around. Malik Sanson could not do much of what I do on Wednesdays. Malik's looking a little tired. That's just, we. he and I just came out of a, a podcast. So I appreciate you all the time, Malik. Ditto with you, Patrick. Appreciate you and your Twitter followers all the time. Patrick, really love having you. Jonathan, Andre, it's been great. We really want to thank you all for that. If you have heard, if you're watching this and you are interested in any of the work that Brother Be Well is doing, either with the Hawk Institute or with the Capital City Black Nurses Association, where Carter Todd is from, or otherwise, um, go to our website, brotherbewell.com. You can go to brotherbewell slash resources, and that's kind of your, your uh, portal for all of the information and all of the resources that are going to help you along your own mental and behavioral health journey. My name again, Michael P. Coleman. I'm your content director with Brother Be Well. Until next time, do two favors for me if you would. Take great care of yourself and everything we're doing is designed to try to help you take good care of yourself. Once you get that down, reach out like we're talking about. Commit an act of kindness. Help take care of somebody else. Till next time, bye-bye.